welcome to the 19th Century Charitable Association's partnership with Writing Matters. My name is Erin Payton and I am the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association and we're so happy to have you here this morning. But I'm really pleased to have you here and I know you're really excited to hear more about Jimmy Carter. And if you have questions that pop up in your brain as the program goes on, you can leave the questions in our Q&A or in our chat feature. And if we have time at the end of the program, we'll call you on live and you can ask the questions yourself. We'll unmute you and you can talk. But in the meantime, I wanna welcome the two guys who are gonna be doing this program. Jonathan Alter is an award-winning author, political analyst, documentary filmmaker, columnist, television producer, and radio host. He's the author of three New York Times bestsellers, and to quote Elizabeth Berg, his writing is as smooth as glass. Let's welcome Jonathan Alter and Bill Young. Well, we go back about 20 years. Nice to see you again. Nice to uh, see you, Bill. Uh, you're a biographer of Franklin Roosevelt, Barack Obama, and now Jimmy Carter. The first full-length biography is surprised to hear of Jimmy Carter. How did you start this project? Where did this where did this idea come from? And uh, well, evolve? so first of all, um, not to start out by uh, correcting my uh, one of my gurus here, because uh, every time I've come to uh, Chicago on book tour, and I'm from Chicago, I grew up on the North Side, and uh, my uh, wife's family, Emily Lazar's family, is also from Chicago. But every time I've come on book tour on my other books. Bill has been my main guy in Chicago, my, my, uh, my guide basically to everything about literary Chicago. So I don't mean to correct my, uh, my guru here, but my earlier books, um, the fir my first book was about uh, Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days as president. And it also covered his first campaign and some other things about him. And then I wrote two books about Barack Obama and all three of those books were what are called sometimes slice histories. They were not biographies. Uh, that would be a, a, a mammoth job, as I later found, <laughs> to write a biography of, of either Franklin Roosevelt or, or Barack Obama. So my first Obama book was about Obama's first year as president. And my second one was about Obama and his enemies. The first one is The Promise. The second is called The Center Holds. So, you know, those books were very different undertakings than this. And, and uh, this one took me five years on and off. I made a documentary in between, but other than that, and some MSNBC and column writing, I was basically working close to full time on Carter. And I first thought of the idea when um, I'm in a book group in New York, I live in New Jersey, but this group in New York, um, brought Jimmy Carter, somebody knew his grandson, uh, to talk uh, at our book group uh, about Camp David. And when I heard uh, Carter talk about Camp David, I realized that this was a virtuoso diplomatic performance and the most important, most enduring treaty since World War II, anywhere in the world. Uh, and it basically you know, ended ancient enmity between Israel and Egypt they fought four wars in just the previous 30 years. And so um, I, I, I thought um, there must be more to Jimmy Carter than the simple shorthand, bad president, great ex-president. And as it happened, my editor, now late editor at Simon & Schuster, Alex Mayhew, was also Jimmy Carter's editor. So once we started talking about this idea, it moved very quickly because she smoothed the way for me to have a lot of access to Carter and his, his family. And I also interviewed George H.W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama for the, for the book. Um, Bill Clinton would only talk to me off the record, which hints at some of the uh, fraught relationship between uh, Clinton and Carter. In any event, I, in 2015, I, I started in on this and I had only met Carter twice, once when I was an intern in his White House for one split second, I shook his hand. And then as a Newsweek columnist, I, I wrote a column about him in 2000 uh, about the Middle East and interviewed him. But other than that, I, I hadn't had anything to do with Jimmy Carter and actually didn't think all that much of him. I had deserted him for Ted Kennedy in 1980 
which in retrospect was a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, and, um, and I also just, you know, I had some questions about certain things he'd done in his post-presidency. Um, and there obviously were great things he did, but I had, at that time, I was a little bit more skeptical. But as I started researching him, uh, I realized that this man was not only enormously complicated, which held my interest, beneath that patented smile is a very, very uh, tough-minded, um, sometimes difficult, uh, but fascinating individual with an epic American, almost novelistic story. Um, but I also found him a relief from what I was, all of us have been going through in the last four years. So I remember one day I was at the Carter Library and um, I was asked uh, to go on MSNBC where I work part-time to analyze Donald Trump uh, coming down the escalator and announcing that day that he was running for president. This was in June of 2015. And um, I, my real memory besides realizing that the demagogue was running for president was when I got back to the library in the late afternoon. And I found that the, the Carter papers were sort of cleansing the toxins that I had just experienced, you know, and that has been my experience all along that Carter has been sort of a vacation for me from Trump, a refuge uh, for me from Trump, his, his Carter's core decency and intelligence and seriousness of purpose uh, have um, been a refuge for me. And what I'm hoping is that they can be, uh, you know, comfort food for, for the body politic, comfort food for all of you and other people. Well, they are. It's an, it's an epic book. It reads like a great novel. And let's take, uh, take a look about the scope of his life. He just turned 96 years old on Friday. Uh, Early on in the book, you say he actually lived in three centuries. Now, he was born in 1924 and is 96-year-old, so he's lived in two centuries. But explain why you said he, lived, he has lived in three centuries. So he was born in southwest Georgia, in, in Plains, Georgia, although he was raised in an even smaller town. So Plains at that time had about 450 people. Uh, the farm community outside Plains where he was raised had about 30 people um, dominated by his father's farm and, and uh, a, a black AME bishop who was nationally famous and was the most prominent person from the whole area, which figures into the story later on. But he had no running water, no electricity, uh, no mechanized farm equipment. He, he used a mule when he was learning to be a farmer, uh, harnessed a mule. Um, they, they, because they were uh, well-to-do for the community, they had a radio later in the 20s uh, and they had a, uh, a car. But other than that, he might as well have been living in the 19th century. And of course, the feudal system, the sharecropper system that he was you know, a part of uh, was just one step up from slavery. So um, really his life, except for the car and the radio was completely indistinguishable from uh, a 19th century life. And then of course the 20th century we know and 21st century, he's not only alive in the 21st century, the Carter Center is on the cutting edge of the major issues of the 20th century from conflict resolution, global health to democracy promotion. And they're intimately involved in, in everything. So he really, has effectively lived in three centuries. Back in the at the beginning, though, he had before he was ten years old, he had two, maybe three people that were instrumental in defining him for the rest of his life. His father Earl, with a with a work ethic and sort of getting him to reach beyond what would be normally thought of for a, for a young boy, and a wonderful teacher that he that he actually spoke about in his inaugural address, Julia Coleman. Uh, he was so lucky to have had her early. Yeah, and, and the third person, well, I mean, they're really, um, you know, so he has this father who he has this very difficult relationship with, even though he does inculcate this astonishing work ethic that Carter has. Um, his father is a white supremacist and his mother um, 
is a nurse and she takes care of uh, black patients for free. Her husband didn't like it that much. She call, uh, he called her Eleanor, like teasingly, like Eleanor Roosevelt, um, which she didn't appreciate. And um, she took Jimmy to black churches and she was considered enlightened by the standards of the area. You know, with, was the only person anybody had ever heard of who said something nice about Abraham Lincoln, for instance. But she was often absent and they actually called the black dresser, the, the uh, like a desk in their hall, the kids called it mother because she would just leave them notes when he was uh, when when he was small and she was out doing her nursing and uh, there was a uh, a black woman farmhand who signed her name with an X named Rachel Clark who was instrumental in raising Jimmy Carter and she taught him all about nature he became uh, the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt and arguably because he was so much more broad gauged, a bet better even than than Roosevelt. I think you could make the case that he was the greatest environmental president in American history, whatever his failures. And, and she taught him about nature and a lot about faith, which of course is such an important part of his life. And after Miss Lillian, that's Jimmy's mother, after she died in the 80s, uh, Carter admitted, and then we discussed, that he actually knew Rachel Clark better than his own mother. And so she was very important uh, in, in, to him. And she, uh, she uh, lived until he became, to see him become president. And um, when they saw each other in planes, uh, as he was about to become president, he asked her to pray for him uh, in office. Um, and then Miss Julia Coleman, his teacher, just one of these brilliant educators, um, very eccentric. Uh, she, speaking of Eleanor Roosevelt, she had become a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's. Uh, and when she was invited to the White House, it was a huge deal in Southwest Georgia that the school teacher had gone. And, and she taught Jimmy a love of literature and to be a critical thinker and many other things. And she left her kind of motto of life, which is we must adjust to changing times, but hold fast to unchanging principles, which when you think about it, I mean, on one level, it's a platitude, but when you think about it, it's actually a very good way of hanging out to your principles as you move through life. And he quoted uh, that in his inaugural address, uh, and uh, no other teacher has ever been quoted uh, in, in an inaugural address. And then, you know, Admiral Rickover, who was a very tough guy and uh, Carter believed with some reason he was the greatest uh, engineer in human history, uh, developed nuclear submarines. And when we think of the idea of putting a nuclear power plant on the back of a submarine, you know, it's, it was like the, the development of the internet in the, in the early 1950s. It was the most exciting tech project in the world. And Carter was right there with, with Rick over for, for part of that project. But he aspired to the Naval Academy from an early age. He'd been from Southwest Georgia while other kids were maybe think of another path, another uh, college, another academic major. From an early age, he had chosen the Naval Academy. Yeah, even though almost nobody in his family had ever been to college, he had one cousin. But he, he aspired to the Naval Academy even before that cousin went to college. And it was his uncle Tom who was in, in the Navy, Tom Gordy. Uh, that was his mother's brother. He was named after Tom Watson, the famous originator of Southern populism, who was a friend of uh, Jimmy Carter's grandfather. And uh, Tom Gordy was in the Navy. He was taken prisoner uh, during World War II, but it was before World War II when he would send Jimmy postcards from all over the world that that fired his imagination about this wider world. Because as he said at the time, when he was a kid, Atlanta, which was, you know, at that time, like maybe five hours away by car, now it's closer. It might as well have been Peking or, you know, Timbuktu. I mean, it was that beyond his imagination. And so when he starts getting these postcards from around the world, it, it really makes him think that maybe there's a, a life for him beyond planes. And, that's a reminder of just how far Jimmy came, what an epic 
story it is because now he's you know one of the world's great humanitarians he's a true citizen of the world and yet he started in this very small uh community in a parallel to uh for the rest of his life is rosalind who he the family is from plains but he really starts the relationship with her at the naval academy and then uh they start traveling the world at that point after the after the navy yeah so just to back up a little bit um so uh, jimmy just turned 96 rosalind turned 93 so the two of them have actually known each other for 93 years because Miss Lillian, Jimmy's mother, delivered, small town, right? Delivered <laughs> Rosalind. And then a couple days after the baby was born, she brought her three-year-old over to see the new baby. They lived just a few blocks away. At that time, the Carters were still living in Plains. It was before they moved to the farm. And so then they, she was a friend of Jimmy's uh, sister, Ruth, uh, who uh, became um, a new age uh, evangelist later, quite well known in the 70s. Um, and they started going out when Jimmy was at the Naval Academy. And in 2015, Mrs. Carter gave me uh, the love letters that Jimmy wrote to her after they were married when he was in the Navy in, uh, in the late 1940s. And I have to tell you, like, it was uh, really exciting for me when I got these because they are easily the steamiest letters ever between a president and a first lady. Uh, they make John and Abigail Adams look, you know, very terrible. Sure, <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, that just was kind of a hint of this. I, I think of Carter as like a, 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 an engineer with a humanist trying to get out. Right, and, and so in his post-presidency, he has a book of poetry, which was very useful to me because as he said to me at one point, I, I often can't express my feelings except in poems. And he, he wrote a novel, he wrote a children's book, he, he has a book of his paintings. He cultivated, he, uh, he refined himself. It's one of the things, instead of joining corporate boards and you know, giving high paying speeches, he runs the Carter Center and builds a house once a year with Rosalind and, and uh, you know, um, writes books. Um, and a lot of them are his trying to work out his feelings about things in his books. And some of the poems are, eh, you know, not so great, but a lot, uh, none of them are bad, but two or three of them, especially uh, one that I quote about when he first fell in love with Rosalind are really kind of beautiful bits of poetry. And um, so this is a, this is not, uh, you know, your standard politician we're talking about. And I think people sense that, um, but in many ways, the most interesting parts of the book to research were the part of parts of his life when he was not president, even though a large chunk of the book is devoted to his presidency. Well, that is what's a, a great unknown. He goes, it's kind of an abrupt change because he's, he's in the Navy, he's traveled the world, and then they decide to go back to Plains. And that's a long time of their life. I mean, they, he, he starts to farm again, they have the warehouse, and then he becomes interested in politics. And he has to straddle uh, a line in the South, which is still, segregationist George Wallace is really popular and he he has to uh, walk a tight rope in terms of uh, both sides of the racial question in order to run for office in Georgia yeah so um, I, he um, because of Rachel Clark and his mother and some experiences he has at the Naval Academy, where he defends the first black midshipman ever to join the Naval Academy from hazing. And then he, uh, he defends uh, some black shipmates on his submarine and actually is estranged from his father over this. So he's an integrationist when he's in the, already when he's in the Navy. And he never, he never was, showed any signs of, of racism or uh, support for segregation. But he comes home in 1953 when his father dies. And Rosalind, who really liked getting out of planes, gave him the silent treatment all the way home. And she said to their older son, they have three sons. People think they just have Amy. They had 
three older sons. And she says to her son, Jack, who's maybe six at that point, Jack, tell your father it's time to stop at a gas station and rest up. You know, she was so mad about having to go home. And her instincts were right because you know, the next year is Brown versus Board of Education. And there's this renewal of what they call massive resistance in the South to any integration. And they pass all these laws. So for instance, Jimmy Carter follows in his father's footsteps. He goes on the school board. He cannot by law integrate the schools and carry out Brown versus Board of Education because Georgia has passed a law saying if the school's integrated, it closes. So he has to do all these things that kind of duck the civil rights movement. And uh, he admitted to me at one point, you know, I never claimed to be part of the civil rights movement, but it actually was worse than that because uh, he's elected to the state Senate and he kind of sugarcoated a lot of his past on this. And I had to take the sugar off. It took a lot of time and effort to, I had to go into the minutes of the school board, for instance, you know, to find out what actually happened and it was not a pretty picture because in the interest of maintaining his business and uh, his political career, he um, took a pass, basically ducked when the reporter from the New York Times came to ask him about racial disturbances in his own backyard, you know, sheriff using a cattle prod on 14 year old girls, sheriff who Martin Luther King called the meanest man in the world made Bull Connor look like a nice guy. Carter's like, wouldn't even unlatch the screen door. Like he's not gonna talk to the New York Times. So, and then when he runs for governor the second time in 1970, after he's had a born again experience and been a door to door missionary for a while, for a few weeks, he says, um, uh, he basically decides he has to run to the right of this former governor who's his main opponent and he runs a dog whistle code word campaign where he says nice things about George Wallace and talks about law and order was, you know, big then. Uh, local control, which is kind of a code word for the, for the, uh, the rednecks, you know, I'm with you. And, um, and then um, on the last day of the campaign, uh, he is being flown around uh, Georgia by this wonderful eccentric Jewish pilot named David Rabhan, an entrepreneur who had a Cessna, was his biggest contributor and took him all over Georgia and was very close to the King family. And Martin Luther King was dead by then, but he had introduced mm -hmm. Carter to Daddy King. And even though Daddy King was supporting his opponent, they connected and they developed a lifelong friendship. So this guy Rabhan, the pilot says, you know, Jimmy, uh, Carter says to Rabhan, David, you've done so much for me. Is there anything I can do for you at the end of this long campaign? And Rabin says, yes. And he pulls out a flight map and he writes, the time for racial discrimination is over. Sign it and say it in your inaugural address. And Carter does over the objections of his other aides. He says this. And right now, I mean, it's like a mom and apple pie thing. Racial discrimination, of course, it's no good. At that time, it was electrifying, it landed up on the front page of the New York Times, eventually the cover of Time Magazine. And so this, you know, th then he could come out of the closet as who he was, but he, he, for 18 years from the time he came home from the Navy, he was basically silent. And so the lesson that I took from this, which I discussed with Carter, is that, um, uh, you know, as he said, after George Floyd was killed, silence equals violence. And so, all of us, arguably, not all of us, but most of us were kind of like Carter on police brutality. We were silent for a long time. We weren't bad guys, but we weren't standing up, right? And, and so when the reckoning came this year, I think it's on us to do what Carter did, which was to spend the second half of his life making up for some of the silence of the first half of his life. And that's what he's done. Well, he, tra and he transitioned from the governor of, of Georgia. He had a four-year term, and four years later, he's running for president. And I met him, actually, in 1975 when he was campaigning in Evanston. Really? At the really? Oregon Hotel, and he said, wow. I'm Jimmy Carter running for president. 
Was what did you think then, Bill, at the time? I had no idea who he was. He was a nice guy. He was earnest. He was, uh, but, uh, you know, a year later, he was the president. Uh, but he worked hard at it. It, it. The fact that he was in Evanston in 1975, but he's yeah. still the governor of Georgia. When did he? No, he was, he was not by then. So he, he was out. He was elected. He could only serve one term, which was one of the reasons he could be a liberal on on uh, race because he knew he couldn't run for re-election. And as he told me, he would have lost if he'd been allowed by the state constitution to run for re-election because they called him Jungle Jimmy. He had very sharp elbows and, you know, he can be real a really cold guy if you cross him. It's very different. Beneath that smile, it's just a whole other thing. But so then his term ends uh, in January of 75 and he spent a full year before the primary started. And he had a big advantage, even though he was at 0% in the polls, because uh, he was running against all these senators who had to go back to Washington to vote and he's unemployed. So he just camped out in Iowa and, uh, and New Hampshire and would go to Evanston, go travel nonstop. He's tireless and actually kind of brilliant retail campaigner, even though he had big political problems later. Some people thought he was, some people thought Jimmy Carter was the best retail campaigner they had ever seen. And he had a lot of interesting tricks to making it work as a, as a, uh, as a retail uh, campaigner. Like um, uh, you don't, um, uh, you don't come late, uh, you come early. Um, and then that way you don't get cornered in the room and you can greet everybody, shake everybody's hand when they walk in. He does the same thing now on an airplane. When he gets on a plane, he shakes everybody's hand. It's not just because he's nice, it's strategic because then he knows they won't bother him like later on in the flight because he's already greeted them. And it was amazing how many people would say, he's here already, he's here early. Because you know most politicians are late and the voters don't really like it. And there's 10 other things like that, but mostly, he was just really smart and responsive to people's questions. And when he didn't know the answer, he would say, I don't know. And he was running after Watergate. So this message, which is a little bit like Joe Biden's message of healing and, you know, I will never lie to you and people and we need, you know, we're a better country than this than we've seen during Watergate. That was perfectly timed in that 1976 campaign. And he, as unlucky as he was as a president, he also was very lucky as a candidate because the other better known candidates often split split the vote. Um, but uh, I can remember being at his Chicago headquarters in the fall of that year and going to the to the uh, uh, candlelight parade, torchlight parade that Daly had for him in the fall of '76 with my mother Joanne Alter and my father Jim Alter. My mother was uh, running that year for lieutenant governor of Illinois. She was on the ticket. So we, you know, we went to the Carter uh, Mondale events that fall, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't get to meet him uh, like you. Well, it was a very brief meeting. I, I didn't <laughs> meet him. <laughs> um, talk about the presidency. Rosalind was, a, was his co-president, really. Uh, so we, we talk about Hillary Clinton and maybe uh, Michelle Obama that way, but Rosalind, Back, this is a was an unknown to me how much a part of that administration she was. Yeah. So the first thing is that everybody who knows her admires Rosalind Carter. She's a really smart, formidable woman in every respect. And uh, so while there was some, you know, chatter in the press about her attending um, uh, cabinet meetings. Uh, most people, she did not attend National Security Council meetings, but she did attend cabinet meetings. And most people who knew the situation were glad that she did because she had a lot more political horse sense than her husband did. And if he had listened to her a little more, he might have gotten reelected. Uh, at one point, um, uh, he, um, you know, somebody said that uh, when there was an important decision to, ma to make, he, he would tell his secretary, you know, bring in Rosalind Tsai, that's the Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, Zbigniew, Zbigniew, Zbigniew Brzezinski, National Security Advisor, Hamilton, Hamilton Jordan, 
who eventually became his chief of staff. And Hugh Seide of Time Magazine said, note the order. She was the top advisor to the president. And she also got a lot, I mean, she became a diplomat. She did much more, much more than Eleanor Roosevelt. And arguably, although she didn't introduce anything, uh, well, I, arguably she accomplished more than Hillary Clinton because Hillary's healthcare plan failed. Rosalind was driving the first mental health legislation in the history of this country, and it actually passed. Uh, and it was her bill. She put the whole thing together, uh, directed the commission to it. It's a very, very forward looking piece of legislation. Reagan stripped all the funding out of it. So it wasn't until Obama that a lot of the ideas that Rosalind had initially gotten enacted into law were brought to fruition. Um, and she also, she was a diplomat. She uh, went on an important diplomatic uh, mission to, to Latin America. And she and the wife of the Senator, Betty Bumpers, they uh, went all over the country um, convincing state legislatures to enact legislation. They got help from Washington to make sure that every child was inoculated before they went to school. So, you know, the fact that you're, when your kid goes to kindergarten or first grade, they have to have, uh, be vaccinated. That, that's Rosalind Carter uh, and many, many other things. Uh, she campaigned for the ERA. It was tragic that, uh, you know, uh, certain feminists, uh, and Rosalind is still upset about this, that the National Organization of Women, they sided with Kennedy uh, because of a tiff that Jimmy Carter had with Bella Abzug. It's a story that got in the way of the Iran hostage crisis. And there's a whole story behind this that you could read in the book. But, you know, the National Organization of Women actually would not endorse Carter against Reagan. They stayed on the sidelines, which Rosalind Carter, who got her husband to actually address the Illinois General Assembly on behalf of the ERA. Who's ever heard of a president talking to a state legislature about ratifying a constitutional amendment? But it wasn't good enough for Eleanor Smeal and the National Organization uh, for Women uh, of Women. And so, you know, Rosalind to this day is like really ticked about that because she, she did work hard for the EPA, ERA. Well, that was an unfortunate part of the four years in the presidency because it, it was sort of one, two steps forward, one step back. And he's remembered right. for the hostage crisis right. and right. Uh, uh, some other negative things and then the landslide uh, loss to, to Reagan. But it's it's incredible what happened in those four years. I mean, the Panama he solved the Panama Canal dispute, uh, almost got saving a saving a war in, in Central America. But Big war in Central America. Uh, Camp David, uh, a huge story, would be enough for for one term of of anybody else. What he did in the Middle East, and uh, you know, fraught with. Uh, well, collapse, and then in going to the Middle East to to uh, to reestablish that connection and succeeding. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, here's a guy. He brings the leaders of of Israel and Egypt to Camp David for like a three day meeting, and he stays there for 13 days and gets a a handshake deal, only to find it falling apart. And instead of abandoning it, he goes to the Middle East and puts it back together. Goes back to the Middle East. Yeah, he puts the whole thing back together with bailing wire and chewing gum, which amazed me. I hadn't known anything about this. This was six, month at, six months after. Everybody tells him, don't do this. You're just going to reinforce that Camp David failed. Don't go. Every, all those people are telling him. They had told him not to go to Camp David, too, because presidents are not supposed to negotiate in person that way. He took enormous risks. He was kind of the inverse of of uh, uh, Bill Clinton, who took few political risks and a lot of personal risks, and Carter didn't take any personal risk because he was clean and faithful, you know. But he took enormous political risks over and over again, and there's just so many great stories about about the Middle East. I mean, one of my favorites is uh, 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 Begin is making it really difficult, and it looks like the Carter uh, entourage is about to go home in utter failure, and. At the last minute, they, it starts to come through, and they're waiting uh, for Carter and Hamilton, Jordan, Jody Powell, and Jerry Rafshoon, who was Hamilton and Jody are dead, but Jerry has been enormously helpful to me. He was his communications guy, and 
they were standing there and Begin comes in, they're at the camp, they're at the King David Hotel. And uh, Begin says, you like this place? You good, nice accommodations? You like the hotel? And they say, yeah, very nice hotel. He goes, you know, I blew it up once. <laughs> in 1948, he had blown up the King David Hotel when he was a, with the Irgun, he was you know, basically a, a terrorist as Hannah Arendt and yeah. Albert Einstein said at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, there are so many foreign policy achievements. Uh, China. Recognizing China, I, the Panama Canal, which should never have passed Reagan. You know, it, it's crazy that the, Carter was able to get it through because Reagan was using it to fuel his political rise. Like, they're giving away the Panama Canal. We bought it. It's ours. We paid for it. And two thirds of the country is against it. Carter needs two thirds of the Senate for approval and he somehow gets it done preventing what everybody agreed would be an open-ended guerrilla war. We would have to spend, send at least 100,000 troops to Panama. Opening uh, diplomatic relations with Deng Xiaoping is the underpinning of the, today's global economy. Uh, and you know there was a long period from when Nixon went there where nothing was happening and they had the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa. Now it's the most important bilateral relationship in the world for all of its problems. And that was Carter again, taking a big risk to do that at the time, you know, people didn't realize what a big thing it would, it would become. But to me, the most important uh, achievement is one that was laced with hypocrisy, interestingly, and that is his human rights policy. So he, was president when the Cold War had just reheated and the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and all kinds of things were happening. And, you know, he had stuck too long with the Shah of Iran, who obviously wasn't respecting human rights. And we had, you know, uh, an association with Marcos in the Philippines and others, where for geopolitical reasons, his policy was hypocritical. But it also, it set the stage for the democratic revolution that in the following 20 years swept the world. And even with today's authoritarianism, the, the world is much more democratic than it was in, in 1980. And after he left the White House, he was um, kind of a little bit depressed. He wasn't in as bad shape as Rosalind was afterwards. She was much more bitter. Uh, he said she was bitter enough for the two of us. Um, and but he hadn't found his new calling with the Carter Center yet, and he was teaching at Emory and doing some other things. And he, he's on the path at Emory with the president Jim Laney, who told me this story. And there's a visiting scholar there named Carl Deutsch, who's down from Harvard, who was one of the great experts on international relations anywhere in the world. And he runs into Carter, who he doesn't know, and he says, you know, I just have to tell you, President Carter, that a thousand years from now, there will be very few American presidents who anybody remembers, you know, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, a few others, uh, maybe John F. Kennedy, because he, uh, at the Cuban Missile Crisis, he prevented a nuclear war, very few others. You will be among them because until your human rights policy, the world had never seen a major power that set a global standard on how governments should treat their own people. It had never been part of the foreign policy of any country. It was like, well, we're not gonna intervene in somebody else's sovereignty. And, um, and you know, they might issue a statement, you know, uh, I think Roosevelt issued a statement after Crystal knocked, you know, but, this was the policy of the United States and they created an assistant secretary for human rights, a position that Trump has kept vacant, tried to put a torturer in there for a while, but you know, this can all be revived under Biden, by the way, we can get back to this. George W. Bush and a lot of other presidents, including Reagan, they maintained a, a, a Jimmy Carter's human rights policy because it's so a congruent, so aligned with the most fundamental American values. And it also was effective. So Vaskov Havel and others said that this was very important to winning the Cold War because we, we used soft power to discredit the Soviet Union. And Carter was very, very tough on that. And he used human rights policy as his, 
as his lever. And yet, uh, amazingly, he leaves the the office with a 26% approval rating, which is it wasn't that Donald low. Trump. That was during the gas crisis, so it wasn't it wasn't that low. Uh, 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 the it, hostage. Yeah, no, that was during uh, in the summer of '79. Remember the gas lines. Sure. I, I open uh, before I back up and tell you know the story of him on the farm. Um, I open with um, the gas crisis, and then it's not his fault. You know, it's OPEC, fourteen-fold uh, price increase over the previous ten years, and, but he's paying a big price. He's in the twenties, and one of the things that he does at that point, which led to a lot of eyeball rolling, but is very interesting in retrospect is he puts solar panels on the roof of the White House. And then of course, Reagan takes them down. Uh, but he was the first president who uh, you know, did renewable energy and, and first fuel economy standards, created not just the departments of, of, of education and, and, and energy, uh, but FEMA, the first emergency planning agency, which is something we could have used now. First president to have the CDC involved in global health the list goes on and on and on, but it's on that energy and environment area that, you know, where he's getting killed in the gas crisis. But he was, I describe him, Bill, as a political and stylistic failure, but a substantive and farsighted success because he's looking over the horizon. He's looking over the horizon. These solar panels are just one example. The most tragic example is after signing 14 major environmental piece of legislation. He took every recommendation from his environmental advisors and took action on it. What's the last recommendation that he gets just before he leaves office that he's already planning to take action on if he has a second term? Something that at that time was described in the scientific community as carbon pollution or sometimes global warming. Global warming. And if he had been reelected, this changes the stakes on that 1980 election, makes them tragic we would have been addressing climate change in the early 1980s. The fact that the United States has been in existence for 242 years, uh, there's only been 16 years when we didn't have armed conflict and four of them were with Jimmy Carter. And uh, I wanted to say that, and also just talk about the, uh, a couple of things since he's, since he's left, the Habitat for Humanity and his uh, reputation in Africa, which is so important. I mean, it led to the Nobel Peace Prize. So first is, is Carter's peacemaker. Peace always comes first for him, uh, both as president and as a former president. And uh, he actually was, uh, there were um, another uh, uh, 12 years where there weren't was an armed conflict, but yet to go all the way back to Jefferson to find a president where we actually didn't fire a shot in, in anger. Uh, and, uh, you know, Carter was very proud of that. And Mondale toasted him as he left office. He kept the peace, he obeyed the law, uh, and uh, he uh, stood up for human rights. And um, the you know, I, I think the most dramatic part of his post-presidency is not building houses for Habitat for Humanity. It's great that he does that. I went to Memphis with him and, and built a house. It was a very fun, memorable experience. And he put Habitat for Humanity on the map. There's a whole story about how Habitat grew out of this interracial farm very close to Plains where that he had, uh, he had, uh, recognized a boycott, a white supremacist boycott against the farm in the 50s. Uh, and, and so his initial connection to it was not good. I mean, he had his reasons because another business, businessman in the community who did not respect the boycott, his business was dynamited. So we're talking white, white terrorism. Anyway, years later, it becomes Habitat for Humanity. He puts it on the map, but he never ran Habitat. Everybody thinks he did. He, he was chairman of the board, still on the board, didn't run it. He goes one week a year to uh, build houses. But the peacemaking that he did, uh, particularly in the year 1994, when he prevented wars in North Korea and Haiti, 
and then uh, and had these you know this really rough relationship with Bill Clinton, which I found fascinating uh, because uh, I call him freelance Secretary of State, and if you're president, you don't like that too much. So there's a lot of tension in that part of the book, but then supervising of elections. Uh, which is so important now, like they've been in more than 115 countries supervising, monitoring these elections, making sure that they go right. And, you know, obviously they're very interested in the American election now. Um, and then uh, eradicating, close to eradicating a disease that afflicted more than 3 million people, mostly in Africa. It's now down to about 30 cases, Guinea worm disease, plus river blindness and some other diseases. So he's a hero in Africa where people name their children after him. And, uh, and you know, I think that was um, part of what they were recognizing, but they also recognized, they actually mentioned him always doing his best in the Nobel citation, which, you know, it's just only one of several reasons that I called the book his very best. And he's all in on everything all the time. The guy's never on Miller time or when he is, engaging in recreation because he's a good shot and he you know does a lot of other things really well he actually is kind of a renaissance man he's all he's always doing it full gauge there's never anything phoned in about well him. he he was also brilliant at bringing in international philanthropy uh when he started the carter center uh he went to the heads of major corporations and got huge donations especially for the for the worm disease in Africa was totally funded by uh, ma major pharmaceutical well, organizations. Merck, and yes. So um, on river blindness, you know, Merck stepped up and with Carter and they made uh, the, the medications for free. And then they, they got uh, other corporations to do all kinds of things. And, you know, without getting too into it, you know, they have an important partnership with the Gates Foundation. Um, so yeah, that, that part of the book, I devote less time to his post-presidency in part because uh, Douglas Brinkley wrote a fat book about, about it all. And, you know, other people have written about discrete episodes in his life. And I was trying to give, do the whole thing. And my sort of, the main corrective, uh, you know, I actually think that his, his, post presidency is a, a tad overrated in the way his presidency is underrated because he had a lot more power as president. So he actually changed more lives as president, which is something that I think people don't know. So I, I went a little lighter on the post presidency, but it's all there. Let's just wrap it up briefly with what he's doing today. He's 96 years old. He and Rosalind are, are in Georgia. I love the, uh, the part of st still teaching Sunday school. And yeah. uh, if you imagine that it's just the traditional Sunday school, it's uh, hugely popular with uh, people make a pilgrimage there to, to watch him teach Sunday school. I guess he's not doing it. Yeah, he's not day, doing but. it right now because of COVID. And he actually, he, uh, some of you might have seen the photograph of him uh, from uh, late last fall where he's on the Habitat site hammering, but he's got bruises all over his face and he had fallen what they didn't know then was that he had a sub subdural hematoma. He had complications uh, and uh, blood uh, fluid drained from his brain. So he had to do this rehab. Uh, he doesn't read very well anymore. And he's, he's 96 years old. And his, he still has all his marbles. And he met with Buddha Judge and Klobuchar and Booker when they made pilgrimages to Plains. But, um, you know, I used to have a thing where I could send him by email, I could send him 10 questions and, you know, fact checking other things. And an hour later, I'd have all 10 answers, but he, he doesn't email anymore, you know, and he's uh, to me or anybody else. And so he's, um, he's more, uh, he doesn't really travel out of planes, um, but uh, on Thursday, they had a 200 car parade for his birthday in, in, uh, in planes. And, and, um, you know, he, uh, He's very, people ask me, you know, what does he uh, think about the book? And he's actually, because of his reading issues, he's listening to Michael Boatman's, uh, uh, I think, I'm not sure that he's going to absorb the book by listening to Michael Boatman's wonderful read. I did hear that he has my book on his coffee table and, you know, people have told them that uh, uh, 
somebody find, I mean, he, he knew that I was doing this and I've been in touch with him. He, he won't, and Rosalind won't like everything in the book. It's very much warts and all. And I don't, I don't uh, pass over anything that he messed up. It's, it's all there. Well, I highly recommend the book. Uh, I think it's a, it's a brilliant job, a, a really uh, difficult and uh, monumental work, a complete work. And thank you for this um, talk. And uh, Aaron, if you have, uh, you want to orchestrate the questions? And sure. and I also Great. thought, just quickly, I, I also want to thank Elizabeth Berg, um, Bill's other half for doing Writing Matters. It, uh, it, it just, did I get the, I think I just got the name wrong anyway. No, it's, it. that's right. No, uh, it was completely you got accurate. It. Okay, so um, it, it's just great that you're doing this because American literary life, it just needs these organizations and we're, we're kind of screwed without them to tell you the truth. You. Oh, well, I got a question for you. Uh, this is coming from John Michelotti. Carter did many great things. Do you or did he have any comments or reflections regarding many of the unsavory things conducted during his administration, like military support in Indonesia while occupying East Timor or the lack of his sanctions for the massacre conducted by the South Korean junta? Do any of these things I form, inform his behavior today? I don't ever see them acknowledged and they are essentially airbrushed out of popular history. So it's a good point. I mentioned the hypocrisy that was part of the human rights campaign. He was late, uh, the US government was late on the massacres in East Timor in the 1970s. They did finally speak out about them, but they maintained uh, relations with the Indonesian regime and you know, that was caught up again in the Cold War. Uh, South Korea, uh, he acquitted himself much better. And actually, um, Kim Dae-jung, who uh, later won the Nobel Peace Prize and was imprisoned in South Korea in the time that Carter was president, uh, when he um, got out of prison and when he was inaugurated as president of South Korea, amazing, he went from prisoner to president. Mm -hmm. Uh, he invited Pat Darien, this wonderful woman, now deceased, who was Carter's Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. And he said that he owed his life to the Carter administration and her efforts. So you, you have to go country by country in terms of how he did on human rights. The place where I'm the hardest on him is, is in Cambodia, mm. because um, as part of establishing diplomatic relations with uh, uh, China, um, they were um, on the side of the Khmer Rouge and Viet Vietnam had attacked and overrun Cambodia and put in a puppet Vietnam government there. And in the UN, this is after the Khmer Rouge, the genocidal killers been driven out the US and a lot of other countries actually sided with Paul Pot's regime in terms of the seating at the UN, which I just found really disturbing and had some conversations with Carter about. And he had denounced the genocide of Paul Pot, but acknowledged that this, some of these other issues got caught up in big power politics. And I do think that in answer to the question, I think it definitely shaped his post-presidential view of things when he wasn't encumbered anymore by the responsibilities of being president. He moved pretty sharply to the left. And, you know, in, in 2016, for instance, was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, this time, he didn't endorse anybody. He wanted a younger candidate. He wanted Klobuchar, Buttigieg, or Booker. Um, but he's very much for Joe Biden. But the point is that he did move pretty sharply uh, to, the, uh, to the left. However, there was, and this is, was fascinating to me, he met with a lot of dictators as a former president, was criticized a lot for it, and sometimes would turn a blind eye to what they were doing because when human rights and peace would come into conflict with each other, he would prioritize peace. And his view was, you can't have human rights until you have peace first. And I'm just trying to stop the bullets from flying. And the human rights 
advocates, and at one point there was a showdown over this with the heads of some human rights organizations. They're saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you're letting these guys off too easy. And it got complicated and fascinating uh, when he was trying to um, uh, chart his way through that. But his basic view was, as one of his friends told me, uh, this woman who lives in Plains, Jill Stuckey, and uh, who uh, I've had dinner with, my wife and I joined her at dinner uh, with the Carters. Uh, she often has them over for Sunday dinner. Um, she said, you know, Jimmy Carter doesn't give a rat's ass what anybody thinks about him when the bullets start flying. Like his, he's just focused on stopping the violence. Thank you. Well, I think we have time for, this is kind of a philosophical question, I think. Um, and it's from Peter Gitz. Peter, I am going to allow you to ask your question. Well, thank you. You hearing me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Hi, Bill. This is Peter Gitz. Hey, Peter. How Thanks are you? for being here. Oh, it's fabulous. And Jonathan, Mr. Alter, I am a big fan of yours and really appreciate the time with you today. Uh, I do ask the question, uh, what do you think of how goodness has been devalued and debased by Trump and his followers? In contrast to, of course, what is often perceived as a good man, John, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter. Well, I think that's, you know, one of the, the worst things on a very long list of disgraceful things that the Trump administration has done and that this man has done personally to our politics. And this is why there's no more important job than, you know, for everybody to work those call tools in, you know, in, in Iowa or Michigan, Wisconsin to, uh, you know, to make sure that he doesn't win. I, he's, Trump is behind in the polls, but um, there's a lot going on that we're not seeing. And so I think it's way too early to say this thing is over. And we know that Trump will challenge the election no matter what the margin is. So goodness is on the ballot, I guess would be my answer to your question. Decency is on the ballot. Democracy is on the ballot. All the things that Jimmy Carter uh, represents are on the ballot. And um, this country has a great capacity for renewal. And Joe Biden was the first US Senator to endorse Jimmy Carter in 1976. And they you know, have a number of good things in common, but in other areas, you know, Carter, while he got a lot of legislation through more than any other president except LBJ since World War II, because he had it partly because he had a Democratic Congress for four years and Obama and Clinton had it only for two. But um, he had a lot of problems with the Congress and he had problems getting along with his fellow Democrats. That's something we need to watch about Biden if he becomes president, but I think he is politically shrewder than Carter was. Mm -hmm. So we might with him, if we catch a break, we might be able to get that renewal of goodness without some of the uh, uh, pitfalls that afflicted the Carter administration. All right. Well, we are ready to wrap up, Bill. Well, thank you. Thank you, John, for, for doing this. It all worked out. Pleasure to see you again. And uh, I'll see you in Chicago sometime. Definitely. And I'm sorry that it didn't work out doing the whole thing uh, live. Uh, but um, I want to thank you, Bill. I'm sorry that I was so long-winded that you didn't get to ask all your questions. <laughs> you didn't get to ask more questions. But you can tell that I'm really excited about this and and the you know the as i think i mentioned the sort of the comfort food quality of this for me i'm hoping to share with readers well you've done it very well yeah. so i uh, we want to just make sure everyone knows where they can pick up a copy of this book if they haven't already well, we suggest the book table, the book table, our local bookstore in Oak Park. That's the book table. But bookshop online is also good for all the independent booksellers. 
It's a really great website and a great way to help all the, the little guys out. Uh, well, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, obviously, Jonathan Alter and his new book, Bill Young, our great partner with Writing Matters and Elizabeth Berg. We so value this relationship and we can't wait for the next one. And everyone who was able to reschedule, thank you so much. Glad you got to see it live. If you want to continue seeing programs like this, you can visit our website, www.19thcentury.org, and make a donation. And we'll be able to continue showing you great programs from authors. And of course, our season starts tomorrow with a music program at 1.30. So there's a lot of great things coming up. But thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.